You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by iWokeUp, flexible loans built for small businesses. Today, we are in Cesena. Where are we, Lionel? Today we're in Cesena, Richard. Is it is that right, Daniel? Sorry. Is yes. it Cesena? Yes. Yeah. So so um, so insecure why, why, in my I, pronunciation. I, I, was, I, was, I, I, I made you nervous. I can't believe that. How can you not know where we are, Lionel? How can you not know? You're not I don't pay attention. attention to, and you know, as long as as long as there's a restaurant, I'm, I'm happy. It doesn't matter where I am. But we're talking, in Cesena. Talking in, of um, restaurants, sorry. Um, before I forget, we're starting in a beautiful town called uh, Trevi, as in the Trevi Fountains in Rome. And one of my favourite restaurants in Italy is in Trevi. It's called La Prepositura. If anyone ever finds themselves there. Well, there you go. There's a, a top tip. Top so tip. we we are in Emilia Romagna this afternoon, but we will have would have come across the corner of Tuscany or a good chunk of Tuscany on Correct, the stage Napalm. eleven of the Giro, our Giro. We started in Umbria, went skirted Assisi, um, dodging the Carabinieri. Hopefully, um, as discussed yesterday, I think um, Lionel and I had a bit of a brush with the the old bill there a couple of years ago. But hopefully, they haven't caught up with us. Um, and as you say, we've we've uh, made a short incursion into Tuscany, the only one of our Giro, and then gone into the hills, the mountains of Emilia Romagna, the Apennine Mountains, and we've gone over Monte Fumaiolo, which was a very famous climb, um, one of Marco Pantani's f- um, favourite training climbs, and then over another one, a little kicker before the finish, uh, the Monte Vecchio, another one of Pantani's favourite my, tra- my old training road sees uh, Daniel um, from... Really? Ba- yeah. I, used to, I spent a couple of winters in Perugia. And used to ride uh, around uh, up to Arezzo. You get as far as Ch- Cesena, I'm sure. No, no, but up to Arezzo and round there, um, around the Lago Trasimeno, um, that was a nice ride. Um, <laughs> don't don't, don't yeah. smirk, yeah. don't scoff. It's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> and now you as well, Lionel. It's a, it's a pincer <laughs> movement here. How come but you didn't I, absorb more of the sort of local flavour? I did. I just I keep it. I just. I just wear my knowledge very, very lightly. <laughs> it barely left a <laughs> fingerprint on you. <laughs> oh, that's harsh. Uh, uh, just a quick question. You you use the the British slang phrase "old bill" for the police. Um, every country's got their nickname for the for the cops, haven't they? What what do the Italians affectionately oh um, call? He, oh, good. He, he doesn't know. He doesn't sbirri. Know. Sbirri. Okay. Mm, mm. It's not as mm, not as mm. uh, not as kind of romantic as the feds or the the old bill or the flicks, is it? Quite, but the no flicks. Way. You like that, do you? <laughs> yeah. Why not? I mean, that's the French, isn't it? Les flicks. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, spiri actually. I mean, it really means the the sort of pigs. But yeah, it's it's often used to refer to the police. Oh, what, what's coming up? What's that. coming up in today's episode, chaps? Well, we are celebrating and interviewing Max Chiandri, who is, well, as I said in the, in yesterday's little teaser, um, the man of Derby, Bournemouth, I didn't know that, uh, Tuscany and Los Angeles, um, the sports director now for Movistar, the mastermind behind Richard Calapaz's overall victory at the Giro last year, the self-styled ninth man, wasn't he? Um, you know, Movistar's run without uh, Grand Tour success was uh, Magic co- Max. coincided. Magic Max, maybe that's the episode title there. Um, but yeah, coincided with uh, Max Chiandri joining the team. He'd previously been at BMC. He's been at uh, the British Cycling Academy for a while and of course was a rider both for Italy and Great Britain. And we'll, over the course of today and tomorrow, we'll find out a lot more about Max Chiandri, including stuff that that I didn't know and uh, things that I'd forgotten from you know long ago because when I first uh, started covering cycling Max Chiandri was quite a big figure in British cycling because it they were not the not the heady days really were they the mid 90s mid to late 90s as Chris Boardman was um, really the only rider 
from Great Britain who was operating at the top level. Max Chiandri became British in time for the Olympics in Atlanta in 1996. We'll hear all about that over the course of uh, today and tomorrow. So, yeah, just a familiar voice, isn't he, Max, from our Giro coverage? He's one of our go-to sports directors, really. Um, He's always got something to say, something entertaining to say about every subject. And so we thought, um, well, he was on my list of people to sit down for lunch with at some point. Uh, but the lockdown has meant we can't do it face to face. So I called him in Tuscany, uh, paradise as he calls it, and uh, we chatted for an hour or so. And we'll play a big well, chunk of it over the next yeah. couple of days. Well, we'll play a little bit of it because the full interview will be for friends of the podcast. If you want to hear the full, the full Max, the Max Max, and you uh, say it'll be on the friends feed along with the Richie Port, the full Richie Port interview as well from uh, a day or so ago. ago. And you say. Napon, we enjoy speaking to Max a lot of the Giro, and um, he's very—he's got a very nice voice to listen to, hasn't, hasn't he? A lovely mellifluous sort of um, very kind of laid back. Typically Tuscan, the Tuscans um, in in Italy. I mean, the purest Italian is always. Um, supposedly spoken in in Tuscany, but the accent itself it always kind of sounds as though they're about to sneeze. They don't pronounce their C's and their G's. They're, ha, hey, you're so in Toscan or like that, and um, and um, it's kind of how Max talks. In- it's kind of how he speaks English as well. I think that's uh, how they speak Italian in Derby. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, stage 11 of our Giro on the RGT platform, something a little bit different today. We are assured by race director Daniele Fribrancini that the transitional stages will be a little bit easier today and tomorrow. Well, there was um, a shadowy backstory to this, wasn't there? Uh, well, there we, were, there were emergency <laughs> talks. <laughs> we forced you to make it easier. Ago. We forced yeah. you to make it easier because it was uh, it was starting to feel really quite hard. And as I've said, I'm only targeting the Intergiro competition. More about that a little bit later on. But today's stage of our Giro on the RGT platform, uh, I'll be riding at 7.30 this evening. If you're listening to this on Wednesday, the day of release, 7.30 UK time, I will be on the start line. The stage is 24.7 kilometres long, only 447 metres of climbing, bit of a hill in the middle, but nice downhill and flat to the finish line. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to knock this stage off in around about an hour, so that will give you an idea um, of, well, well, you'll probably know that, uh, well, most people will be better than me at cycling. So well, if I can do it, you can, you can join us on the start line 7.30 this evening. See you there. I was reminded today, Lionel, that um, Pantani showed up for the 2000 Giro Sporting, a bit of a goatee. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, there'll be shades of Pantani, echoes of Pantani when you fly over that Monte Vecchio climb on the, um, on the stage today, won't there? I might dig out some form of bandana or, I don't know, table, bit of, tab- bit of old tablecloth, <laughs> tie it around my head. <laughs> You're listening to The Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iWalker.co.uk. I W O C A.co.uk. My name is James, James Turner. I am the IT manager at iWalker. Uh, super passionate about everything uh, to do with bicycles been sort of following the industry uh, and racing uh, and taking part in racing um, for as long as I can remember Um, and it's something that helps me keep uh, very much sane um, and and unoccupied in my downtime. I love the fact that Iwaka does get involved in in not just sort of straight business activities and and Iwaka as a company uh, we see ourselves very much as an enabler um, for other small businesses and so I do see the sort of the sporting angle of things being an enabler to society if you will uh, as very much more a sort of just an extension on that and on that mission if you will we do have on staff quite a few talented athletes uh, from many different sports um, but personally sort of being very involved in, in cycling myself uh, selfishly I, I, I really enjoyed that sort of announcement It was great for me to hear out of the blue um, from my friends in the marketing department 
uh, that they were thinking of getting involved initially uh, with cycling uh, and then seeing the additional activities that have come out of the department has been uh, it's just fantastic. Amar Kord, I remember... What, what, you want me to pull over just in... Yeah, just here, just th- this village here what? that we're coming into. Park next to that square over there? Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay. Dove si amo, Daniel? We're in, Lionel, now that you mention it, a place called Seramazzoni, which no one has talked about, the, the fact that it's on the Jura route this year. No one will probably mention it today. However, about eight or nine years ago, I came here to interview a certain Riccardo Ricò, the infamous, the outlaw of the Giro. And I'm kind of curious to see, well, I don't think he lives here anymore or he's spending most of his time in Tenerife, but I'm very curious to see if anyone remembers him, um, how much they know about what he's doing now and what kind of legacy the Cobra, as the self-styled Cobra, that was his nickname, wasn't it, has left in li- little Seramazzoni up in the Apennines in Emilia-Romagna. Extraordinary. I mean, loads of people out here this afternoon. Lots of pink banners and balloons that we've seen all along the route. But no rubber year, snakes. Right? We haven't seen any cobras, have we? No, no cobras. You just wonder what the atmosphere would be like here if Rico was still racing and, and wasn't sort of exiled from cycling, exiled from the Giro and, and basically retired in disgrace, banned, banned for 12 years. Well, I'll tell you what, should we get out of the car, have a look around, see if we can track someone down who knows where the Cobra is hiding? No, we will take two bicchieri of water and two cafés. Allora, the water is the Caffè, sì. Ah, non, non si prova. Grazie. Neanche voi, voi non conoscete Riccardo Ricò? Adesso è stato cancellato dal giro. Cioè, nessuno ne vuole più sapere. È stato da tutto proprio. Sì, quello che ha fatto. Yeah, we used to see him a bit around here. He was an idiot. The house is empty, up for sale. Here, the general opinion is that he was just a donkey, a complete ass. Which is maybe what he is. You going to give it a go? Give him a ring? Let's try. Uh, hang on it. No says, harm. It's, it says they're Cobra Rico. I'll be quiet, Lionel. You might answer. His phone's either off or he can't be reached at this moment. He could be in that. He could be in that restaurant after. I think he's in the, at the... He's skulking around at the back of the fridges somewhere. Maybe we should go and have another look. Either that or he's out training. Well, that was the regular feature, Amarcord. Remind us, Daniel, what Amarcord uh, means. Well, it's very appropriate. You should ask, Rich, today of all days, because we're near the birthplace of um, Federico Fellini, probably the most famous Italian film director of all time. And Amarcord was one of his films made in the 1970s, sort of deals with and talks a lot about nostalgia. Well, it talks about the the period of fascism in Italy and um, Fellini's sort of recollections of that period. So um, it's the it's the name, the appellation that we've chosen for our little nostalgia trip every day, isn't it? And today's was uh, stalking Ricardo Rico. It was. Um, we, Napalm and I, went high up into the hills, just slightly west of where we are today um so in the hills above modena um on the trail of ricardo rico remember him the donkey i could be forget the donkey we forget where is he now where is he now well um at last check and this was fairly recent um i've got no reason to believe he's not doing this anymore uh he was in tenerife he has emigrated to tenerife and he's opened an ice cream parlor his uh, doping ban must be about to end. Do you know what? Soon. I looked that up. I looked that up recently because I had a notion that it was 2020, but it's actually 2024, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, well, we, he, should, he we, really... should, we should have ra- racing again by then. He'll be racing you, you boys on our Giro 2024. <laughs> actually, where do we stand on that if Rico pitches up? Is he allowed to take part in our Giro? As long as he puts what, his what weight in accurately and hasn't been eating a load of ice cream. Um, or rather has been eating a load of ice cream. 
Somebody go and check his fridge, not for ice cream. I mean, he was extraordinary in that 2008 Giro, wasn't he? When uh, well, he won the he was second overall. Um, he won the white jersey. Alberto Contador won the race, and uh, that was the year Contador had kind of come off the beach. But the the um, the, the kind of the most explosive rider of the race was Ricardo Rico and uh, then at the Tour de France he was equally explosive and then well it all blew up in his face didn't it because he got arrested and uh, tested positive for the second or third or fourth generation EPO type drug called Sierra along with uh, Leonardo Piepoli um, of the Saunier Duval team quite a boom and bust for Rico well, wasn't it and he, and he came back didn't he and then was disgraced again a couple of years later when um the, there was a story about a, a, some kind of dodgy blood bag or blood bag that had been that had gone off um, at the back of his fridge. You know, I mean, between the parmesan and the margarine, or he probably didn't have margarine. I, I imagine you've got margarine in your fridge, haven't you, Nate Palm? But no, <laughs> absolutely not, not, not an no, Italian. Absolutely not. What stork margarine? No offense to anyone who likes stork margarine, but but no. <laughs> I mean, R- Rico's dodgy blood in his fridge takes us nicely into our our wine of the day feature doesn't it <laughs> vino del giorno chin chin the cycling podcast full giro now makes its way to tuscany so we've got the cosimo from cosimo maria Massini 2016 this particular wine is 90 percent sangiovese and 10 percent field blend now the field blend comprises of six indigenous varieties from tuscany that are all co-fermented with the sangiovese then fermented in large oak barrels for 12 months. All the fruit from Cosimo Maria Massini is farmed biodynamically, hand harvested and crafted by my good friend Francesco. Now, Francesco only makes a a sum total of 14,000 bottles, which sadly meant we ran out and had to switch to the Padera Brizio Rossa de Montalcino also another fine exponent of Tuscan wine. This particular wine is 100% Sangiovese, also from biodynamic vineyards that's then been barrel aged for 12 months and then allowed to settle in bottle. Now, this particular wine, like the Cosimo, really appropriate for sort of stronger cheeses, darker meats, grilled meats and stews and casseroles. Both fantastic exponents of Tuscany. I hope you enjoy. Cheers, Rich. Mm. I see you haven't updated your stemware. Still in the same glass. Well, not. I mean, I clean the glass, but it's the same glass I use for my wine. This is my Arugiro wine glass, Daniel. So, mm. Rich, today, um, well, I said we were going to Tuscany. It was a pretty gr- gratuitous incursion into Tuscany, mainly for the purposes of our wine of the day, because um, the, the three great regions of Italian cycling are the Veneto, Lombardy and Tuscany. The three great regions of Italian wine are Tuscany, um, Piedmont, mainly Piedmont, and the Veneto. But our Giro, the way it was shaping up, we weren't probably going to get into Tuscany. So I had to do a bit of manoeuvring to get us there. And today's wine is a is a Tuscan, not only a Tuscan wine, but a super Tuscan wine. Well, uh, super. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's lovely. It's it's, it's it's a spectacular wine. We'll have a little tribute to the wine, actually, at the end from Francois Tomaso. Any tasting notes? Uh, well, um, bit of, sort of well, potpourri there. Well, Napalm, do you have potpourri as well as margarine in, in your house? Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not uh, sampling the wine at the moment as I have uh, an errand to run. I've got to drive a little bit later on. So I will uh, look forward to my Tuscan mm. wine with dinner this evening. Well, there's, there's licorice on the nose, Daniel, and uh, well-integrated tannins, I would say. A lovely, lovely reading from Vivino. Um, no, no, again. actually not um, on this a, occasion. No, I actually... Oh, so I, I you, did you some, reading it from somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, well, no, I didn't... I, I spoke to somebody about it, actually. Oh, really? Done some lovely. research. Lovely. Um, it's a Sangio, it's a Sangiovese. Sangiovese is the big um, grape from Tuscany. Um, also from Emilia Romagna. And, and do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to regurgitate. This is the most read passage ever in the cycling podcast. I must have read it out, um, read it out about five times by now. But it's Gianni Mura Punto, the day that Marco Pantani sadly died. We're going to um, near Pantani's birthplace today, so I thought I'd read it out again. Um, so Gianni Mura said he'll probably become a myth like they always do when they die young or when we don't understand why they've gone. I would rather have watched him grow old and gone for a glass of San Giovese with him somewhere up there in his hills. Yes, 
Nice, well, nice words for a. Well, what, it's, it, it it is a. It, you will enjoy it, Lionel. I, you know, spoiler and, alert: you will enjoy it. And Rich, um, as I was going to explain, they um, this is what's known as a super Tuscan. Super Tuscans were sort of invented in the seventies, <laughs> when a group of like of high profile winemakers in Tuscany they they were a bit frustrated by the very rigorous um, regulations for wines like Chianti, famous wines that which dictated how much of a certain grape variety could, could, could go in those particular wines and they went rogue um, a bit like the sort of gravel revolution in cycling the last couple of years they sort of went off piste and went off label and they decided to to make these wines that didn't really pay heed to any particular regulation and they called them the super tuscans and they're very they're generally very expensive and very sought well, i was going to say it's the punchiest uh, wine i think price wise in our our Giro collection put together by Divine uh, Sellers in London and uh, you can get a case of our Giro wine can't you from Divine Sellers you'll the details in the episode notes and um, Greg from Divine is giving a proportion of all sales to uh, the cycling school in Cheney which we're raising money for through the sale of Stacey Snyder's mugs a second batch incidentally will be available soon we'll give you details on that very soon but we're going from one super Tuscan to another aren't we Max Chiandri, someone who's figured in all of our lives covering cycling for the last uh, 20 years or so, hasn't, hasn't he? He's a, a, an, an ever-present figure, really. So, well, my dad, a uh, chef, uh, he, went, uh, he went to the UK when he was young, like 16 or 17. Uh, so I'm talking about, uh, about mid-50s. He went over to the UK to work in london as a chef and uh and then eventually met my mom and and that's why then they got married and all three of us i got a brother and a sister both of them younger and we were all three born in uh, in derby at the time my mom was british her parents were british and uh so we were all three of us born in in england then we moved down to bournemouth and then when i was around 10 years old so around 77 we moved back to Italy. Well, we moved to Italy. It was my first time, obviously. Do you remember much about Derby or Bournemouth? I mean, I can remember. I remember, um, yeah, I can remember Bournemouth. I, I went to school there. I went to school in Bournemouth uh, because um, when I was seven, I moved. So I went to school there and I remember that. I remember that side of it. I remember the ice cream van coming along when the little street we used to live in and and stuff like that, you know. I got some vague memories of when I was uh, when I was a kid in the UK. But uh, you know, the, the 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 majority of it is is obviously Italy because you know, then ten, twelve, then you start to remember a little bit more of of your 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 small your infant side of it, you know, the so, kid side of it. So, were you brought up in a household that spoke both English and Italian, and you learned both yeah. as a kid? Yeah. So I didn't I didn't know much of Italian, but yeah, Italian was a bit. You know, it was spoken in the house. My dad used to speak quite a bit of Italian to us. But uh, but it's it's pretty funny because when we came to Italy, and uh, they put us right into school. So I I just remember I sat in school, didn't know a word of Italian, or just like a few little things here and there. And uh, I kind of got I got through school without, you know, it took me quite a while to learn to learn the language. But I kind of learned it the hard way, just like put it to school every day and just quiet all morning and kind of that was it, you know. So it was a pretty, it was a it was a pretty brutal trans, transition from it from England to Italy in in that way, you know. So when you moved to Italy, I, was that to Tuscany, and was, was that your first visit to Italy, or had you been on holidays? Uh, that was my first time in Italy. That was wow. my first time in Italy. So we moved. Uh, it was funny because we moved uh, down where Tirreno starts, where the last like four or five years Tirreno started with a team time trial. We moved right in that area on the coastline, and uh, that's where I lived for like another ten years in Italy in that area. Which which town is that? Lido di Camaiore. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, Viareggio, Lido di Camaiore. That's where Tirreno starts every year. I mean, for the last at least four or five years. And what did you make of that? Look, going from Bournemouth by the sea to Lido de Camariore by the sea? No, it was pretty it was strange, obviously. It was, a, it was a massive transition. You know, at the beginning, I, I, as I said, I didn't know the language at all. And that was a big barrier. But then you just, you know, you kind of make friends and, uh, and you know people. And 
you know, kids and, and, and you just pick it up pretty quickly, you know. So it was just me and my brother, my sister, she's six years younger than me, so she was quite small at the time. And so we just me and him and slowly, slowly we kind of made ourselves, you know, Italian in a way. <laughs> And just um, just on your dad as well, because he he ended up in Los Angeles. I seem to remember. Have I got that right? Or you got it right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're still there now. Yeah. Uh, so he went there uh, to to run restaurants. So yeah, then we came to Italy, and basically we stayed in Italy for another ten years, more or less, something like that, nine years. And and one day in 1985. Uh, when I was then cycling uh, with a friend, he decided to go over to L.A. because he had cousins in America. So he had cousins who were in the wine business and they are still in the wine business now in San Francisco area. And, you know, they told him, come over, come over, try, you should try. So he just went over one day, him and a friend, and they came back and they said, OK, L.A. And, we, and, and in 1985... He brought us. He brought the whole family to Los Angeles. Wow! So, so that was another transition. And how long were you over there? Well, uh, my parents, my mom, dad, my brother, my sister—they're all still in America. They're all American citizens now, and uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I stayed there for roughly three, four years, something like that. Four years. I stayed there for four years. Yeah. And is your dad still working? Yeah, yeah, my dad's still, he, he has a few restaurants. They have like, uh, as a family, him and my brother, and my sister, they have uh, they have six restaurants all in LA. They had a, they had quite a few restaurants uh, around America. They had them in New York, they had them in Miami, they had them in uh, Vegas, they had them um, in San Francisco and Los Angeles. They had a lot of restaurants, like a company around. But then, now they're all down in LA. So, so Los Angeles. for some of our listeners who will be in or around Los Angeles, wh- what are the names of the restaurants that they can go and take a visit? So, yeah, well, actually, the most famous restaurant he had is actually, they, they closed it literally a few months ago, and it was called Ago. And it was him and Robert De Niro, that's a good friend of him, and they partnered up. They had quite a few restaurants. But they, you know, they have a lifetime, so... This one had a lifetime, a span of like 15 years on it, and they decided to close it after 15 years, literally a few months ago. So it was called Ago, and it's a very known restaurant in Los Angeles. Well, that was the uh, one, Robert De Niro and uh, Ridley Scott, I think, and maybe some other, um, the, some the other mo- celebrities, was it? Yeah, the, the, the partner of my dad was him and De Niro, they opened. And, 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 and De Niro, you know, calls my dad Ago, so I said, let's call it Ago, as in Agostino, as an abbreviation. So that's how they call the name Ago. That's how they call that restaurant Ago. And uh, unfortunately, they they closed it. They literally decided to close it a few months ago, after 15 years. But they have uh, my dad has two other restaurants called uh, Toscanova. One is in Calabasas, and one is in Century City. They have uh, Cafe Roma right in Beverly Hills on uh, I think Camden or Beverly Drive. They have another restaurant called Sortino down in Brentwood. And the latest one they open is in downtown. What downtown LA is 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 coming back to its, its beauty, and uh, and uh, it's called Vespaio. It's right next to the Disney Hall, and it's right in the center, the heart of downtown Los Angeles. That was opened a couple of years ago. Has your dad got like a signature dish now that you would you would say oh, if you ever if you ever over in LA and you do drop into one of his restaurants that you, that you like? No, not really, not really. It's, it's more it's very Tuscan food. So, you know, if, if people know well Italy, you know, Sicily and, and the north side of it and, and whatever. But Tuscan olive oil is one of the main ingredients of everything, I'd say, because that's how we are in Tuscany. But it's, uh, no, it's, uh, it's a pretty well uh, good menu and sort of fish and, and meats and, and pastas and so on and so on. Do you uh, the Tuscan dish that I I think it's a Tuscan dish is it the the um, papa al pomodoro the the papa bread pomodoro, yeah, the yeah, bread and tomato yeah. soup I mean yeah. I I always have that if I if I can that's a very me. poor dish on the days you know so when the days they had a lot of you know I on say during the war but it's like a dish where you had the bread and you have the leftovers of the bread and you just you know with the water and just make the bread soft and then put the pomodoro in it's very 
drop of olive oil, a bit of uh, basil on it, and there you go. Simple. Simple. So yeah. you, once you got to Italy, I mean, Italy, like England, you know, football mad. Um, but cycling, obviously, uh, probably the, still the number two sport in in Italy. And mm-hmm. pr- probably in the 70s, when you were arriving there, probably rivaling football as, as the number one sport. Um, but how did you get into it, especially if your dad wasn't really interested in sports? What exposed you to cycling? Yeah, so it was, uh, it's, it's like when you talk, when you just asked me that question, the, the, the picture of when I really started is so alive in me and so real. Uh, basically, we used to go to school with a bike, me and my brother. We had one bike each, little, like, in Italy they call them Graziella. It's like a small little bike. And the, and, the, and, the, and the top tube runs down, so it's like for, more for ladies. So we had these bikes, and we used to go to school. It was literally a couple K, a K and a half. And one day, this guy, this friend of mine, this um, this 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 guy who went in the same class as me, shows up with this race bike. And it was the first time I ever saw a race bike. And I saw the handlebar went down, and I was like, "Wow, this bike looks amazing," you know. And I was like. So we had this little Cavalcavia, and Cavalcavia is a bridge what goes over the freeway. That's how they call them in Italy, Cavalcavia. So I remember me and him riding to school because he lived near my house, and he had this really slick looking bike. And going up this Cavalcavia, this little, it's nothing, but just imagine when you're 10 years old, this little, you can just feel that little bridge. I used to drop him, you know, literally go away. <laughs> so I was like, wow. So he's like, you know, and this was it, and he, and he was racing in the local town, uh, and and the club was called GS Versilia. So, for people who know a little bit Italy, Versilia is all the all the all the beach side from Viareggio up to Forte di Mar, Mimasa, Cinquale, all that side. And the team was called GS Versilia. So, basically, seeing him with his bike every day going to school, and I saw he had this thing to change gears, and I was like, whoa, 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 this is all great, and. So what I did, I asked my mom and she signed me up in the local club, cycling club. And that's how I got into cycling. Nobody, I, I asked them and my mom absolutely had no clue what bike was and cycling was. My dad absolutely had no clue. I mean, yeah, Italian, maybe he knew about the history of, of, of the Italian cyclists in the day, but he's, he wasn't into sports at all. So that's how I got into it. Can you remember what your first race bike was? Um, what brand it was? It was a, a local. Um, it was a local because you had a in the days in the seventies, eighties, sixties. You had a lot of bike manufacturers. You know, very small little, and it was called Cicli Baglini with a B A Baglini, and it was around Pisa. And he was the guy who supplied bicycles to Jesse Vercilia to the team I used to race with. So that was my first bike. And a funny story, just to, just to, it's like talking about a million years ago, you know. So the team, when you go, when you show up and you sign up for the team, you get a bag, a nice bag, and and the clothes, all the clothes they give you, they're all used from the guy from the year before. So you wouldn't get a new pair of chamois, you know, or, or shorts, or a new jersey. You get a jersey that's been used and maybe has a little hole from a crash stitched up from the year before so that's you know we're talking about many many years ago and then you know these small little cycling clubs what struggled all the time probably and and, and, and if uh, you got a good jersey without a hole in it you know that was something to something yeah to be that was a, that, that was that was a sunday jersey for the race you know because races were on sunday at the time so were you good when you started racing? Was it um, immediately obvious that you were quite good at cycling? Yeah, so I was good right away because um, <laughs> that's a, like, a pretty shit statement. But um, um, I did my first race. I remember Ready, Steady, Go. I still remember it. It's incredible. It's like, boom, right in my head. And I just wanted to ride in the front of the peloton. I just imagine these 30 little kids. And I go on the dirt. I remember start and I just sit in the front the whole day sit in the front, sit in the front, and just riding in the front, and I finished like seventh, or six, or six or seven, I can't remember. But when you used to show up at a bicycle event, at a bicycle race, usually it was like a bar what used to organize it, you know? So, uh, and the bar is usually like the, the hub of, of the local bike club, you know? So 
what you do, you get there with a van, with a car, and all the families get together. They bring all the kids, the, t the sport directors there. And you used to go inside the bar and look at your category and see all the prizes. So uh, let's say G1, G2, G3, depending on your age. And so I used to show up, first race, and I go in the bar and have a look, and I see all the little cups, like little trophies, no? That's not, sorry, cups, trophies, small ones. I'm talking about first, second, third, fourth and fifth and then you know they always give you like uh prizes in in like a mortadella salamino a pair of shoes what they didn't sell in the shop you know local people would give in stuff and these will be the prizes for the kids so basically to just cut it short i finished like six or seven and i went to the after the whole event you go and it's, it's uh, the la premiazione it's when they give all the trophies out I didn't get a trophy. I got a little medal. So I was so pissed about that. And I just sat in the car and I was like, I'm going to stop cycling. I wanted a cup. I wanted a trophy. I just remember I was so pissed about it. And then uh, we went on to the second Sunday. Uh, it was my second race and I got second. And there I, I got my little trophy and I was all happy. And then I think the third race I won. So it started out pretty good. <laughs> but the first one, I still remember it. Yeah. And, and so was it a fairly smooth progression? I mean, you, you, you're going pretty well and then suddenly you're uprooted and you're off to Los Angeles. I mean... Uh... No, it, was, it started like this. So then I, I, I you know, then I'm, I'm riding well, I'm riding well and then suddenly I'm, I'm, you know, I'm moving into categories. And then I go into the national team. So I'm riding with... It's funny, this story, it's like Dario, Dario Bruccardo. He was, a, he was a big Italian coach in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I think the most, one of the most representative figures in, in cycling, in the Italian Cycling Federation. So he was the head coach on the track. And in 1985, Italy picked me for the European Championships on the track. And uh, I, I wear the Italian jersey. And uh, I do a race in, uh, up in Vigorelli, you know, the Vigorelli Velodrome, in the way where Coppi did the hour record, what was, was now dis dismantled. And, uh, and, and I, win, uh, I win the scratch race. Uh, I win uh, one of the European, because they had like a few tests, you know, like a few events, sorry, of European track. And I won one of them. So, and, and I, won this, I won this race. And then literally a few, few weeks after, I'm on the plane, I'm, I'm, I'm going to LA. So, and it's funny, and, and I brought all that stuff to Los Angeles. So when I go to see my mom and dad, I got my, because they changed a couple of houses, but the house they live in, it's, it's been there. They've been living in it since, since when they almost moved to America. So all my, my, all my national Italian kit, when I had the Brit Italian license, was well, still in LA. So, LA gave me basically the chance to see both sides of life and uh, and it gave me you know it opened doors in terms of you know I started working in the restaurant with my dad and and I just put the bike away and I was like I'm stopped cycling that's it you know and you know I'm talking about 86 87 you're 17 years old living in Los Angeles it's pretty pretty cool place to be you know and um, I stopped cycling, stopped cycling for like eight months, eight or nine months. And then one day my mom <clears throat> came to Italy and I said, mom, I want a bike. So she brought me a Fanini, a Fanini bike, <laughs> back, back to LA. And uh, then I started cycling again. I always had a dream that I wanted to turn pro. So when I went to America, that was, it kind of cut that whole dream I had, you know, and I was like, and I was fascinated by the life in LA and so on, so on. But when I started cycling again in Los Angeles, I know that's a good side of it because um, one day I, I give another little story. One day we had this, this, they used to have these criteriums all around America sponsored by American airlines and, uh, and Nabisco. It's like Nabisco is like being bought by Nestle, like a big uh, cereal company and biscuits and so on, so on. So I used to go around America flying and, and racing. And they had this criterion in West Hollywood. And I lived in West Hollywood when I went to America. So, boom, West Hollywood criterion. I'm racing 
literally with a jersey on my own. It was different. In America, you just apply for a license, put a jersey on, and you race. And here, the whole team of 7-Eleven shows up, and Jim Awkwards is there, Finney is there, and all the 7-Eleven team. I'm talking about 87, 80, 88, something like that. So we're doing this, we're starting with Criterium, and we come to the final lap, sprint, and the whole line out is for, for, for Davis Finney. And I go and sprint, and I beat Davis Finney, and I win, and he gets second. <laughs> so I'm talking about this little kid, it's me, and I beat the whole 7 Eleven. And, and it's a funny story because that's when, when I met Jim Awkwards. So I know Jim Awkwards from 1987. <laughs> And uh, you know, and then I work. Uh, we're together again in BMC, twenty five years after. So it's yeah. incredible. The Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport, our uh, long term supporters. Uh, you can get twenty five percent off all your Science in Sport products at scienceinsport dot com with the code Daniel. A man who can hold five languages in his head, but not a seven-character discount code. 25 SIS. 25 SIS. SISCP25. It's deliberate. It's it is deliberate. deliberate. SISCP25 <laughs> at scienceandsport.com. 25% off all your Science and Sport products. Science and Sport are getting me around our Giro. I must say, I have been uh, consuming a lot of their stuff. A cup of energy bakes today. Um, so, yeah. Get your science sport stuff at sciencesport.com. Now, Lionel, we've reached about the midpoint of the episode. We, not just the midpoint of the episode and the midpoint of our chat with Max Chiandri, but the midpoint of our Giro. This is the middle day of our 23 days of coverage, and this is the middle of the middle day. You're at the and, midpoint uh, in your case of wine, Rich? Um well, <laughs> probably. Yeah. You, you, re- <laughs> you reached the interjure of our wine no, tour a few no, days no, ago, no. didn't you? No, I've been pretty disciplined actually recently. Well, I found after probably three or four days of our Giro on the RGT platform that um, the I just haven't got the time because of you know recording the podcast, researching for the episodes, and and mainly uh, because of increased childcare duties. I haven't got haven't had the time to ride all of all of the stages. So I revised my target. Um, just quite happy. You don't hear to that from many riders, do you? At the Giro, you don't hear that a lot. Like I just, I just didn't have time to finish the stage yesterday. Why didn't you finish? I didn't have time. <laughs> well, to be I was fair, busy. I was busy. <laughs> to be fair, it is their jobs to ride, and uh, you know, it's not my job to ride our Giro, is it? To be fair, um, so I've revised downwards to just completing half of each stage. I've been dubbing it the Inter Giro. Um, people may not be that familiar with what the Inter Giro competition was, but it ran from 1989 through to 2005, and the winner or leader of the competition wore a very fetching blue jersey, the Azuri jersey. It was first won by a Slovenian, Jure Pavlic, in 1989, succeeding in taking a Giro classification where Primoz Roll. Glitch fell short last year. Uh, quite an illustrious list of winners, really. Phil Anderson, Miguel Indurain, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, Tony Rominger, and this man, Magnus Baxted. But how did the Inter Giro competition actually work? Let's hear from Magnus, who still has his blue jersey at home somewhere, about how they totted up the times and awarded the blue jersey for the Inter Giro classification. Uh, well, that that is actually quite an interesting one. Uh, and I don't think many people have actually managed to get this right yet. And uh, i got to say, when I started racing the race, I didn't even understand it properly. So all of a sudden I found myself in that uh, jersey. But... Um, Basically, it's uh, halfway through the stage, there is a finish line. And it works just like the pink jersey would do, uh, where, you know, if you're in the breakaway, you um, accumulate time. So it's uh, basically trying to, uh, I guess, emphasize um, and give people who are more of a breakaway specialist, not necessarily uh, a sprinter or a climber or a DC rider as such, uh, an opportunity to, to get a jersey as well. So halfway through the stage, every day there is a there is a finish line. And first across that line every day, uh, obviously, gets then a time. And um, that time is then um, accumulated over the uh, the 21 days of racing. 
Uh, and also there are then um, into sort of bonus seconds on that on that line as well. So if it does come down to a punch sprint for the halfway finish, uh, then there are bonus seconds to be had as well. So, um, um, yeah, I don't know if that made anyone any wiser as to what the Intergiro is. But um, in, in short, that's how it works. For me, it wasn't really something that I targeted. Uh, and it was I kind of all of a sudden ended up being in breakaways left, right and centre. And with that, I found myself then being right up there in the mix of uh, for, for the Intergiro competition. And when we realised that, then uh, we sort of started putting a little bit more of an emphasis on it and we started to do, to do you know, proper lead-outs into the, uh, to the finishes for, for the Intergiro. And obviously I was already quite um, sort of... Um, used to being in breakaways a lot and obviously I started looking for more and more opportunities to get into breaks but uh, as 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 the race went on it, obviously the other guys who were sort of competing for the Intergiro then they started putting teams on the front to bring the break back and so on and so on so it was kind of a, a, a very hard fought first half of the bike race um, and then it all of a sudden then sort of chilled out a little bit once we got past the halfway stage, and then the uh, the, the GC guys who went for the uh, the pink shirt in Jersey started racing. It was something that was a bit, um, um, how should we put it, um, a bit of a mystery to everyone really, and then even to the to the riders to, to a large extent until you sort of were all of a sudden in the mix of it, and uh, and you sort of went okay. I got I got to work out what's going on here and how I will actually win this. Um, and obviously the, the the time trial stages were exactly the same, so that's where I really ended up sort of cementing the uh, the win for the the Intergiro competition was in the in the two time trials that um, we had that year. One I think was into Bolzano um, where I finished second, but I basically went all in to the. Um, to get to the, the the halfway point of that time trial um, and managed to do so with a significant lead and and yeah that that really got me sort of a good sort of gap ahead of uh, of the rest of the riders. I, I'm I'm really quite proud of having having won it um, and I remember it was a really really hard year to uh, to try and hold on to that uh, to, to that particular competition. I had Swarada and uh, Zabala chasing me in it so. Uh, yeah, having to battle with uh, with Swarade in the sprints uh, final week was uh, was quite difficult. Now, the, just lastly on the Azura jersey, um, the blue jersey, it, it's of course the the, the colour of the the national team, isn't it? The the, the football team and the and the cycling team wear <coughs> blue. So, did did people recognise that when when you were riding round? Did it resonate with with the spectators, or is the Giro just about the pink jersey? No, it, I, th- I think the, the, the Italian cycling um, fan is is already very very clued up on on all of the jerseys and the sport in in itself. So anyone who who wears a jersey, uh, I think, gets his sort of due recognition by uh, by wearing it. And um, yeah, I definitely got a lot of. I think a lot more fans by wearing the the blue jersey than I would have otherwise. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's. I think for me it was a really cool thing to, to actually have a jersey to to wear in the Giro d'Italia and it's still hanging proudly on my wall at home. So we've passed the halfway point in our Giro so let's return to my conversation with Max Chiandri and pick up the story as he's about to turn professional. Remember if you want to listen to the whole of this conversation unedited it'll be available soon for Friends of the Podcast. So when I turned pro for that team in 1989 I already had contacts with Carrera and Ariostea they wanted me but I was very loyal to one guy, and this guy was the sport director of that Dromedari team when I went as a little kid, and it was called Callino Minicagli. And this sport director, we remained friends, you know, and he saw me kind of, you know, disappear, went to America, and then came back. So he said, okay, turn pro with me in my team. And it was a small team, and the star was uh, Baron Kelly. Giambattista Baron Kelly was his last year pro. And um, I turned pro with this team. Well, it was basically a team that had very, very small budget. Um, and uh, Baron Kelly was at this end of his career. We never really 
race together much. And I remember the team actually at, by mid-season folded up in terms of, you know, we, we had the jerseys, but they stopped paying us and, and, the, and they didn't have bike parts. And so I'd say three quarters <laughs> into the season, I signed my contract with Carrera and I actually raced a few races with a Carrera bike in that team. <laughs> it's a funny okay. story. Yeah. Well, Baron Kelly, of course, had won uh, the Giro di Lombardia a couple of times. He'd, he'd been on the podium at the Giro. He'd got a silver medal at the World Championships. So, mm-hmm. um, and you, were, you, would, you got your first win in your first year in the Giro di Romagna. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I won the Romagna, but I was second in Lazio. And uh, the second place was Lazio was a very, very big thing. I won't say like winning, but Lazio at that time was 260, 270K. Uh, Charlie Mote was away with two Russian guys. I think they were Alpha Loom. And uh, these two Russian guys had cramps and they stopped and they pulled out the race, literally, because the whole race was all around Rome. And then we came into Rome and we did a couple laps around the Colosseum. And uh, I didn't know that they pulled out. so. We did this, uh, the, 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 the sprint was a sprint where we did a lot and many times after in the years, but it's, it's a pretty strange sprint because you kind of run on the side, you had the right side to finish and you run on the other side of the road going up, U-turn and then dropping down into the finish on the cobbles. And I remember I went to sprint and as all these Saloni was there and all these guys and I beat them and I, and I got second. But I thought I was like fourth or fifth because I didn't know that there was only Charlie Motier in the front and the other guys stopped. So Carlino Minicali comes to me and he's like, straight straight to the TV, they want you on TV. Because in the days, you used to go on TV right away on the finish and there's Adriano De Zan. So De Zan just loved me because he said, here he is from America. He was an actor and he did a lot of movies. And so that was my story for <laughs> my first four or five years, bro. And he used to say to everybody on TV, and he did movies, and he's a friend of Ursula Andres, and, and this and that. And here I am on the podium. So you were Max, Max Chiandri straight out of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But he, he loved the whole story. The Zan really kept me like up in the air a lot, you know, and he had his own people, what he liked. And I was one of them. He really... He really liked me. So then, basically, second place in uh, in Lazio, and then a weekend after, I won uh, Giro di Romagna. Yeah, and it was a great, and a great. And even then, I beat uh, Rosola, Saroni. Bon- I remember Bontempi almost like a K to go with, like, and he was in Carrera. I mean, I'm talking about Bontempi, one of the biggest sprinters in the days, and and I win that race. And <clears throat> and very sadly, Carlino Menicali died a few few months after and uh yeah or, or or right away yeah at the end of the year and then um, but then i signed my contract with Carrera, and then kind of you know and then you pick up you're in better teams and mm. then your career starts well well just to give the listeners some background i mean they may be familiar with the Carrera team but it was one of the biggest teams in italy at that time sponsored by a company that made jeans stephen roach had won the giro and the tour for Carrera a few years earlier and mm-hmm. you you were coming into the team just as claudio chiapucci was emerging as a, a as a potential exactly, exactly. yeah Both and of us, yeah so your yeah. first year with Carrera, you you rode the tour de france and now people might think quite strange for a, a young guy to to get a start in the tour quite so early these days it's it's not that common is it but i guess in those days the giro was probably number one goal for carrera and the and the tour was uh you know obviously still a huge you know the biggest race in the world but it was strange in those days wasn't it for the italian teams they were still so focused on the giro just above of, um, and ahead of the tour yeah, no, no, exactly. And there's what, there wasn't many teams that used to go and do the tour. Uh, I mean, uh, in Italy, you had a great calendar, a lot of races. If you won any race in Italy as a, as a pro in the early, early 90s or, or late 80s, you always find a contract for at least one or two years. They had a, an, a massive amount of races in Italy. So a lot of teams were happy enough with, with that. And only a few teams we used to go and race the Tour de France and as you said Carrera was one of them so I went to uh, first year pro and Capucci was just kind of coming out of his uh, who he was I went to the Tour de France and I'm talking about you know I'm talking about 280k stages we did a team time trial about 
80 90k i remember there's a feed zone in it and i was like this little kid of 21 years old in this in this master team and it was a, it was a pretty brutal experience but i just want to open a little a little story here and and, and just to to, to so so list, so people can understand when i had the academy I'm, I'm i'm jumping forward a lot of years now when when the academy the british academy was here in italy and uh we we had uh, we had all these pro I mean all these guys kind of wanting to turn pro as in uh, Stanar as in uh, G uh, Fumi was here you know all these guys and so what did we do one year we put them in a team uh, called Barlo World what was run by Claudio Corti and Gary Thomas went to the Tour de France at like 21 years old so I pushed him into that team and I pushed him to the Tour because for me going back to when i did it as you just said in carrera was a massive life experience and it literally changed me the day i went in and the day i came out as a different person as a different athlete and as a different was, human being was that because of the, what you have to adjust to so quickly the, the difficulty of it yeah just because um i think you have to do things now in cycling you know sometimes i know it's about programming and and a lot of it is now about programming and, and, and really looking at, at, at events and, and targeting stuff but a grand tour is for me the most important thing a, a, a young rider can do a neo pro can do because it it really uh, gets you get to know yourself inside out and and it really tells you my weak spots where i need to be better and how I can change and what I need to do you know so the sooner you do it and the better it is that's what I think and I mean that that Tour de France was a a real baptism of fire for you anyway because on the first on the Sunday morning of the opening weekend Chiapucci got into that four man break with Steve Bauer Ronan Pensek and Franz Massen and they they got 10 minutes on the defending champion Greg LeMond and all the other favourites and and the race really boiled down into a pursuit between LeMond and Chiapucci in the final week didn't it so you were in a position where you were working for um, the yellow jersey for a number of days I mean that must have been quite a learning experience on its own yeah no no it's a a massive experience for me in, in every single way one because I was a young kid and, and, and what I missed, I'm, and here is another little point, is I, I missed the, the, the amateur racing in Italy because I came from America. I did one year in Italy as an amateur. Uh, I got the jersey and the pink and the baby Giro. Uh, and and uh, it was a year when the Konishev won it and, Amstein, and Andy Amstein won the pro uh, scenario. So I just had one year of, of amateur. So what I what I didn't have what ex, was experience. I didn't have that experience I needed of maybe three, four years of amateur racing, maybe a few stage races as a as an amateur. And I went straight into the pro world with no with no background at all. Uh, and I had to make experience quickly. So what that's what I missed, you know. And 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 i didn't have the you know i didn't have a mentor what was behind me and could say hey you need to do this and it's how we do things mm-hmm. just like the first year with that baron kelly team was just like kind of everybody was on their own and then i i'm straight into carrera and then into the tour so i missed all that part but i had to I had to make up for it and and just listen to guys and and and, my, and one of the guys what guided me the best in that tour was massimo girotto and he was my mentor and really helped me to get to Paris and, and, and give the best for the team because uh, he, was, he was a good guy. As in Guido Bontempi, he was just all about himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, actually, he just didn't really... Well, we get on because now he's, he's, he's on the motorbike in the Giro. He's like, you know, one of them guys in front of the, of the race and I'm a director or whatever, but with two ordinary people. But he wasn't wasn't that friendly when I was in the team so but I found a great guy in Girotto what really helped me to get to Paris and, and, and do my job during the race and then the following year you won your first Giro stage and it was ahead of Le Monde wasn't it yeah it was funny because uh, again here my mentor comes in and we're riding along the coastliner before Savona and it was up and down it was pissing with rain I remember and like and he's like and he's like, he comes to me, he says, how are you? I said, I'm, I'm feeling okay. He said, I feel like shit. He said, 
He said, hey, if you want to do the race today, look at that guy. And I, I, put, I put my head up and I look and I see this guy and I say, oh, that's Greg. Literally, okay, after, boom, Greg attacks on a little kick-ups. And I go with him and it's uh, me, him, and uh, a guy called uh, Copolillo. Oh, and yeah. he never pulled, he never gave one turn, never gave one turn. <laughs> Behind, uh, we have uh, Del Tongo with Cipollini, 1967, just like me. So he's kind of coming out of his shell, you know, he's, he's another guy starting to win. And the whole team of uh, of uh, Del Tongo was pulling. So we had like a minute and a half and it comes slowly, slowly comes down. Then we get to Sabona right in the center and it's like a big road, big, big wide road, slightly uphill. Finish and we're just pissing with rain. And I remember Greg starts out the sprint. Copolino gets dropped, actually gets caught by the peloton, at K to go. And he puts a couple of meters on me. And I'm like, you know, when you get out of his saddle and it's soaking wet and you've got a couple hundred Ks in your legs and ah, my legs are killing me. And he gets one meter, two meters. And then, then I pull him back on his wheel and then I start pulling out, you know, and I did the, then I beat him. And I, that was my first stage. Great day. Was that, that was a big deal. I mean, beating the Tour de France champion, in a, in a Giro stage, even in the rain. I mean, that must have been a great day. Yeah, fantastic day. You know, and then it's like, you know, I'm here, I'm in the big world, I'm in the real world. And and uh, it, it was, I don't want to say to the people who are listening and or it's like, it's different, but it was different because in the days you had one winner, one leader in a team and everybody had to work for him. Now, you know, you set out for, okay, you can go for Paris-Roubaix, obviously you're going to have one leader in each team, but you go out in a lot of races and, and, and a lot of people can win and, and it's more open. But in the days, you really had to work, you really had to put your head down for, 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 for the leader, you know, and it was, well, it was a little bit harder to, to put your head out and say, here I am. It took it was a little bit harder in them days than, than, than now. And if you had a good chance to do something and you didn't take it, you might not get another chance for exactly. three months. Exactly, exactly. Well, it, was, it was really enjoyable to hear Max Chandry talk at length and quite expansively about his journey um, because we, we do know him well, Lionel, but we don't often have an opportunity to sit down with him and, and have that sort of conversation. And as I said earlier on, the whole conversation will be available to friends of the podcast if you want a bit more of Max Chandry. Um, that will be on the on the friends feed. You can sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com if you want to hear him and also Richie Port from a couple of days ago. Um, and we do know him these days, I suppose, primarily as a, as a sports director, BMC, and more recently a movie star. Very, always very approachable, isn't he? And always very uh, willing and, and happy to talk. And... I guess one of the things listening to him talk about his days as a writer is to be reminded about what a good writer he was. And um, one story that really s- pricked my attention was was the the, the win, it's a small race maybe, but in West Hollywood where he took on Seven Eleven, who had been riding Grand Tours. And later in our series, we'll hear from Andy Hampston, who had ridden the Giro d'Italia for Seven Eleven in 1985. And they were starting to get a foothold on European racing, starting to ride well. I mean, Davis Finney, who he beat, you know, was a very, very good uh, sprinter in Tour de France stages and so on. He won a stage of the Tour de France, didn't he, in 87? Um, so they were they were a very strong team. And for Max, you know, he, the, way, the way he describes it, I kind of imagine him turning up at that race wearing jeans and on a kind of fixie um, and taking them on and, and winning a kind of hipster Max Chiandri in Hollywood, um, but that that story and, and and others did sort of just reinforce or remind me what a good rider he was back in the day. I think one of the interesting things about Max as well, Rich, is that, and I wasn't aware of this until I listened to the interview, um, was just how much time he had spent in the states and in. Um, in his youth and and how much he was kind of viewed as a bit of an oddity um as something quite exotic or someone quite exotic when he then came back to Italy because um you know the 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 picture he paints of of Tuscany and Tuscan cycling and Italian cycling um in those years when he was growing up and when he was in Italy is this kind of honeyed sort of Instagram sepia toned um vision of of Italian cycling that's been lost really you know competing for a mortadella and and a cup and you know every every village had its own frame maker and you know even when I 
lived in Italy for a short period in the late 90s that was the case you know when you went out with guys cycling everyone would would have a, f- a frame made by a different artisan and and you know that over the course of the next sort of 20 30 years was lost has been um lost to a certain extent and um yeah it, it, i found myself getting quite sort of wistful um about that when max was talking um a, a, about the time he spent um in tuscany and sort of becoming a cyclist it's made him a very interesting um, guy for us as well, because you you sense again it came through there. We you mentioned his his Tuscan identity and that he is a kind of super Tuscan, but he also there's a sense of him not really perhaps feeling um, a full sense of belonging himself in Italy. You know, um, he he didn't grow up there in his early years, um, so to us he's very Italian. To the Italians he might be, you know kind of anglo-italian and yet he's got this kind of american streak running through him as well so he's kind of very multinational and of Um, of course he's he's still been spending a lot of time in hollywood and and you know acting in films under the non de plume matthew mcconaughey for years (laughs) no one's no one's really picked up on that i mean combining that with movie star ds well i guess that's possibly possible isn't it i mean doable manageable and rather overlooked by the Italians, especially when it came to the World Championships. I mean, I'm just looking back at the, the sort of purple period of his career from sort of 93 through to 95 when he was winning, you know, the Giro stages. He won a stage of the Tour in 95, famously lost to Bjarne Ries in a sprint in the 1993 Tour. And on the Channel 4 coverage, the, the, the interview after the finish line was him basically just incredulous that he'd lost a sprint to Bjarne Ries. Um, but that year, 93, third in Milan San Remo, third in the Tour of Lombardy, third in the overall World Cup, and yet he wasn't really, he was, he was more of an outsider when it came to the Italian World Championship team. And that's what led him to um, take up a British racing license in time for the Olympic Games in 1996. And we'll hear about that in tomorrow's episode and also about the 2000 edition of the Giro d'Italia when he was riding for the Linda McCartney team. I mean, this is a, this is a, a whole can of worms in itself isn't it the the boom and bust of the linda mccartney team but they did get to the giro in the year 2000 the first british backed and british run team to ride a grand tour since the anc halfords team had done the tour de france in 1987 and i mean we take for granted now don't we team sky team ineos and all of the british success but at the time linda mccartney getting on the start line at the giro was quite a big deal and max was very much the figurehead of that team the the um, you know, the, well, he almost won a stage the day after his teammate David McKenzie did win a stage. And we'll hear a bit more about that tomorrow. You mentioned him losing a sprint to Bjarne Ries. And, you know, I remember when I first started watching cycling. And in fact, the first race I ever saw live was the Leeds Classic in 1996. And Max lost a sprint there that I think most people thought he should have won to um, his countryman, uh, well, um, the Italian Andrea Ferrigato. And um, it, it seemed to me that for a number of years, uh, around about that time, people did sort of view him as a bit of a, a choker is a very harsh word, but someone who didn't take opportunities when they were presented to him. I mean, was was that fair? He was, he was, because he, he had a fast finish, but he he was a guy, I mean, we're on transition stage today in our Giro, and that's sort of appropriate too, because he was a man for the transition stages to get into a break. And my memory is of him often losing those uh from those positions where you you know on paper it looked like he had a very good chance of winning yeah and that's why listening to him and listening to some of his successes and listening also to lionel's list there of of some of his placings as well does remind you that he was he was a good rider well we'll hear a little bit tomorrow about how when he did get an opportunity in the olympic games he came away with a medal um not for italy but for great britain but that will come tomorrow i enjoyed that story very much indeed um yeah lots to look forward to tomorrow in our giro and um, that's all for tonight. We're going to play out with Francois Thomas, aren't we? And his his little tribute to the spectacular red wine that we've enjoyed during this episode. You and me, Daniel, anyway. Lionel, you've got that to look forward to. Um, until tomorrow, chaps. Is this is this a song by UB40? Um, um, y- red 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 wine, is it? Yeah, yeah. Is but it's not originally a UB40. Was it song, not you, originally UB40?
Well, originally, Daniel, of course, it was a Neil Diamond song, uh, but the most famous version of it, arguably, is is UB40's version. Until now. Till now, yeah. I, I do, I, I very much enjoyed Francois's version, so I hope you do too. That's all for now. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Red, red one Goes to my head Makes me forget that I still need a son. Red, red one, it's up to you. All I can do, I've done. Memories won't go. Memories won't go. I'd have sworn that we're done. Thoughts of you would leave my head I was wrong, now I've found Just one thing makes me forget Red, red wine Stay close to me Don't let me be alone It's tearing apart My blue heart I've sworn that with time thoughts of you would leave my head. I was wrong, now I've found just one thing makes me forget. Red, red one, stay close to me. Don't let me be alone. It's staring. Oh, well, yeah, a little song by Neil Diamond in this in the UB40 version. Uh, well, just to uh, remind you first that you know too much red wine can be dangerous, but uh, but you know just uh, as much red wine as you need is great. And um, well, during our Giro, as you know, uh, you you have a chance to discover lots of uh, great Italian wines. To be honest, you know, being French, I find them sometimes excellent, but much too expensive for what they are. But anyways, uh, no, Italians have got beautiful wines, of course. And, uh, well, as far as I know, uh, well, there'll be lots of advice and um, a wine list for the for the Giro in our Giro. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to discover lots of them and, uh, and try them as well. And once again, without overdoing it. Um, well, that was François Tomaso with my little song for Algiro. And, um, you know, um, well, see you soon and um, uh, keep well.